Kirk is in the water. Please let us know when we are cleared to go ahead and release. You are clear to release. And uh, Kirk is away. Roger. Be ready to power on at Atlanta. And deck, uh, tether is all out. Roger. Atalanta's in the water, heading down. Good copy.
This is an audio slate for dive H1953. UTC time is 01-12-45. Mark. I'm here in the front. I don't uh, I don't know what I can do to offer to help with that actually. Okay, 50 meters. Roger, just stand by one for a second, Sarah. Are the the ramen folks okay to descend? Okay, all right. All right, let's go. 27 meters per minute. Yeah. Yeah, sorry guys, they, the ramen guys are good. I'm still getting organized back here in this seat. <laughs> that's right, that's all the left on. <laughs> Dave's on his way up. Mm -hmm. The ship? Yep, yep. So you were, are you logged into CELA? That's good. Um, I can log you out here. Oh boy. I, <laughs> <laughs> I got confused too here and the monitors. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah.
Walter, who made Super Seven, usually said these were under himself. Science sets them up for themselves. Yeah, they, they flipped something yeah, last night. Yeah, we're struggling with that. Yes, last night, they were, last night they were quite confused. And I just kept pushing buttons until Adam said, okay, I can work with this. <laughs> okay. But I... Yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, that's okay. I usually do forget it, so <laughs> fair enough to ask.
Can you hear that? No. Okay, then we're good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, we are on our third dive of the expedition. Sorry, we've been silent for a minute. We've been having some computer problems. Um, but yeah, today we're still in the Pacific Remote Islands Territory. We're still outside of the um, monument, but still within the EZ or the Exclusive Economic Zone. And we are diving to about um, 13 hundred meters today. We have the laser dive bot on our vessel, which is why we're not going much deeper. And this dive will last for about 16 hours. Or nope, not 16 hours, 13 and a half hours. So yeah, we're just on our descent right now. Um, and we're at 290, or 295, 295 meters. So yeah, there's been some jellies on screen. Of course, nothing that we have, um, that we're able to really ID. No sharks this time, unfortunately. Maybe when we come back up, but yeah, stick around. Um, and we'll be on the bottom soon. Thanks for introducing the SPL chat, Sarah. Oh, uh, we're getting some things situated on our screens. Now I will be your host here for the SPL. My name is Daniel. I'm a science communication fellow on this expedition. And feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat on our homepage. And we will have a team of scientists and engineers here to answer your questions. And I completely forgot to introduce myself. My name is Sarah. <laughs> there is a bio if you want to read more about me, but I am one of the scientists during this expedition. Um, and I'm, we're all here until four. I don't know if anyone else wants to introduce themselves, <laughs> but um, yeah. we do not have Guada. Ooh, a jelly. Ooh. Um, we do not have Guadalupe today. She's a little seasick. Hoping she feels better soon. Um, but we have Paola today. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Paola. I am part of the science team and this year's science intern. And today I am feeling up for Loopy until she feels a little bit better. And I am this watch data logger, so I'm going to make sure everything goes on record and all of the exploration thingies. So very excited to be here with Sarah and the team. Glad to have you on our watch, Paula. Thanks, Anu. Hmm? Yeah, that's good. Yep, that's fine. So, let's see, we have our watch today. Uh, Cheyenne and Amber, would you like to introduce yourselves when you get a moment? Sure thing. Hi, I'm Amber. I'm uh, the video engineer on watch today. How's it going? <laughs> Another beautiful day. Um, I'm Cheyenne. I'm the navigator for this watch. And we also have our laser dive bot engineers. I don't know if they're busy right now. I didn't want to call them out. Um, <laughs> yeah, they got a special work table yeah, today. Yeah, they, <laughs> they have a whole new system over there. 
Yeah, I couldn't find the uh, unmute button. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Has anyone heard that before? Uh, um, yeah, we're here today, and, uh, and I'm Pablo Sobran, uh, City Institute and Impossible Sensing. And with me, I have uh, Kevin Sack from University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. He's the one who's busy here, so I can talk a little bit. So uh, today uh, uh, is the third time that the laser dive boat uh, goes down. And third time is a charm. Uh, today, we, after we fully commissioned the technology over the last couple of dives, we are going to be using it as a scientific uh, instrument. So we've gone from tech demo to, to science as a service uh, system. So we're excited to be here today. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Is it my turn? Yeah. Yep. Good <laughs> work. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dwight Coleman, and I am the watch leader on the uh, 12 to 4 watch. And I am from the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. And I am also the expedition leader on this cruise. Thanks for joining. We have some more siphonophores floating on by. Yeah. Yeah, it looked like a bunch of bubbles, but it yeah. was too organized to be just bubbles. I swear those siphonophores, they look like eye floaters. I just see one drifting by, yeah. and I'm like, did I see that? I have to take a double take. Yeah, <laughs> especially when we're descending. Some iridescent thing to the side, but yep, we're currently at about 460 meters. Wow. We're about half an hour from the bottom. Awesome. Nice. Thank you. About how fast does the ROV Hercules die down? Well, um, usually going down, we are restricted by the winch's kind of maximum norm normal you know, safe operating speed is about 30 meters a minute. And then coming back up, Herc usually is the limiting factor coming back up and somewhere between 15 and 20 meters per minute, depending on the load of uh, samples we have and stuff like that. Wow, did that look like a fish or another jelly? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it was a jelly, but could have been some type of fish, some type of worm. That was definitely another siphonophore we just passed <coughs> by. But yep, lots of mid-water column organisms floating around. Yeah, this seems like a lot more today. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and some objectives for this dive. Nothing much different if you've been watching along. Um, we we're just exploring the other side of the seamount that we were at yesterday, the unnamed um, Tabletop Mountain that we were at yesterday. We're exploring the other side of it, and we're just looking at the geology and biodiversity. Um, so just trying to see whether we see that same huge, um, those huge communities of corals really that we saw yesterday. That was an incredible dive. Some sort of jelly coming up? I don't know. That was a tough one. <laughs> but yeah, just continuing. I wonder if there will ever be a survey of like the mid-water column, and just how many jellies and siphonophores that we just see drifting by. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. wow, look at that one popping into view. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's it's looks like oh, wow. String. Interesting. It's like somebody drew on the screen. What do you screen. think he's done, Sarah? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. That. That's pretty cool. It's a neat Ooh. one. Yeah. yeah, got some definition on that one. Um, and just for any new viewers or anyone who wants to know, we keep saying the name siphonophore, but they're just, um, they're a family of, well, they're in the same um, classification as the other jellies, but they're a bit different. They're colonies of individual zooids. Um, they're kind of like corals in a way, that they're colonies of animals strung together. Um, a, I guess like a more shallow water example that many people might know is the Portuguese man o war. Um, yeah, they have tentacles, they can hurt. And actually, they're mostly, ooh, huh. wow, seeing a lot of things today. Um, they can actually also 
they're usually predatory. So they use jet propulsion and their tentacles to capture their prey in the water column. Would they be classified under, I believe, Nadaria? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Nice. So that's a uh, family that includes corals and hydrozoans and jellies, saponophores. Mm -hmm. What puts them in that category? Like, what are the traits that they all share? Do you know? Uh, I mean, generally, um, they're all jellies. <laughs> um, they all have stinging, ooh, another sort of maybe tinafore or jellyfish. Very faint. Um, they're all, they all have some sort of singing, stinging cells usually, even if they're not really used. Um, and yeah, phylogenetics, that was actually, um, obviously um, the genetics of everything and how everything is related to each other um, that's still under some contention but Nidaria is one of those um, phylogenies that are pr pretty solid. Um, Nidarians are a pretty solid monophyly I believe which is just meaning that they're everything is under one clade they're all Nidarians there's not some sort of weird group that's like on the outside that isn't a Nidarian. Oh, let me actually, <laughs> let me correct myself. Tinafores usually do not have stinging cells, but, um, yeah. Wow, it's like we're getting a whole uh, college semester course right here on this expedition. <laughs> oh, man. I, that's such a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Inverts are really cool and sometimes complicated, but. Yeah. My start calling you professor. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, learning a lot about taxonomy when I took my paleontology class in undergrad. And a little bit about my background. Uh, I uh, majored in geology. I got a bachelor's in geology in 2022. And after that, I worked as a park ranger at Bryce Canyon National Park. And that experience brought me to the Nautilus here today. And yeah. Uh, in my paleontology classes, uh, a lot of what we learned about ancient Earth history was really starting out with how to learning how to classify life. And the best way to do that is by studying the deep ocean because there's so many fossils of marine invertebrates just within the fossil record that uh, so many species are that we catalog and categorize today, we can easily trace this lineage back hundreds of millions of years ago. And if we understand how life kind of exists, it's less of a one-two step to getting to, say, from a fish to a person, and more just a big branching tree with everything going every which way. But many different species have a common ancestor when you follow the tree back. So that's where we uh, I can say we can find different classifications like species, genus, uh, phylums, all over, all other sorts of uh, categorizations yeah. that mm -hmm. kind of feed into the bigger picture. So if you ever wonder, like, all those terms that we say, uh, they're really just going up that tree to categorize different uh, species and where they fit on the tree of life. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Great explanation. Um, and I was actually talking with Dr. Brian Kennedy last night, um, just about how old a lot of deep sea species are. There's still a lot of work to be done, but we know that a lot of these organisms are super old. Um, they've gone through a lot of evolution over time. Um, for example, we picked up one of the samples last night was a chitin. Um, I forget the scientific name for that. Let me check. But basically, there are these mollusks, um, these gastropods, these snails that are, um, they usually attach themselves to like rocks and that they're a more um, basal form of a snail, essentially. Oh, look at that little pink fish. I think that was a shrimp. A shrimp? Maybe a shrimp, yeah. Something, it's too fast. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's just a bunch of old things in the deep sea and we don't have a lot of records of it because the ocean floor is constantly um, renewing itself, which I wish I could explain more in detail, but I don't remember. 
Um, but yeah, the ocean floor is just constantly recycling because of, um, you know, the process of, I forget what it's called, but there's all the fossils from like uplift? however many millions of years ago are gone down there of whatever was able to be preserved. Yeah, so a fossil record is easily biased. Um, earlier I mentioned that there are many invertebrates within the fossil record. Things like, say, arthropods or crinoids or sponges that have, say, calcium carbonate or silicate shells that are easily fossil. Well, that's not really a word, but they can easily fossilize. Versus, say, a jellyfish that once it gets to the bottom, it's easily going to disintegrate and you don't really find much of that in a fossil record. So, yeah, it can be a little tricky studying the history of organisms when we're trying to understand how something existed today, where it came from. And that could be uh, involve a lot of creative uh, science to understand that. So, paleobiology is a way of studying uh, biology in a deep past, and one of the methods they use uh, as Sarah was saying, is uh, phylogenetics. Uh, looking at the DNA of uh, modern creatures and uh, comparing that to other creatures and seeing where their uh, common ancestor was and kind of building up a tree from there. And another way we can understand life in the deep ocean is by taking eDNA samples from the water column. eDNA is just environmental DNA that floats around. Like in this, uh, you see all this snow going by, that's called marine snow. It's detritus from all sorts of organisms, whether it's uh, dead skin, uh, feces, uh, other animals that have died and are falling out of the water column. And all that DNA is just floating around and waiting for us to look at and analyze what it could be from. And it could tell us about the biodiversity of a specific place, and we could even track species that may not be present at the moment, but we might find that their DNA is in this region. So it could give us clues to where to find them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's part of our mission um, as we explore these. Um, ooh, no. jelly. Another jelly. That was cool. Um, as we explore these new regions, we're able to identify and characterize the communities more. Um, when we take samples, we're also sending them back to museums and people who want to um, take genetic samples of them so we can see what, you know, what their DNA looks like and how they're related to other corals. Because oftentimes we also find a lot of corals that, you know, we can maybe say it's maybe a black coral, but it might be a completely new species that we're not able to identify just by looking at it, which is most of the time for corals. <laughs> um, so you really, so that genetic piece of it is really important. Um, but getting a good look is the first step to getting um, to knowing these communities more. That jelly. Mm. That was Thank definitely. Oops. Yeah, that was definitely a jellyfish. Um, Skyped it so in. But. 
Yeah, so we are. Oh, go on, Daniel. Oh, no, you can go ahead. I was just going to say, we're about 25 minutes away from bottom. Yeah. Oh, we've been sitting here for a while. I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, look at that floating by. Ooh. Yep. Yeah. This might sound really gross, but sometimes this stuff floating by reminds me of, like, dish water. <laughs> oh, my God. I was going to say, don't, don't say it, please. <laughs> <laughs> dish water. <laughs> I was just... It's funny because I was just reading something about how you should properly clean. There's like a whole debate on Reddit about how you should properly clean your plates. And people were debating whether um, filling your sink is like hygienic or not. I don't know how I feel about it, but hey. Either way, something's got to get cleaned. Yeah. <laughs> so we have some questions from the chat that we like to answer. So someone asks, scientists say that squids are attracted to lights on evening dives and recovery. My question is, aren't a lot of squids found in extreme depths where there isn't light? Or what attracts them there? Yeah, so um, obviously there's squids of all types of habitats. Um, there is a specific there's a specific phenomenon in the shallower depths in the photic zone. The photic zone is where there's light, um, which is above 200 meters. Oh, sea cucumber. <laughs> nice. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I keep getting distracted. Um, there's this phenomenon called diel vertical migration, where basically species um, migrate up and down the water column during certain parts of the day to, um, there's a bunch of different hypotheses, but like one of them is basically to avoid the harshness of the UV rays and sunlight. Um, so certain species will go up in the water column during certain parts of the day, some will go down. Um, I would assume that squid, like whatever squids are attracted to the light um, on the ship, they are going towards the light because their prey is also attracted to, to the light and they want to eat their prey obviously so when they see the light from the ship they're like hey there's probably fish up here or um you know whatever crustaceans or other arthropods they might be eating um and that's why they're attracted but that kind of causes like a cascade effect of okay the, sh the squid are going up so then the mahi mahi come up to eat the squid and then sharks come by to eat the mahi mahi um and yeah so kind of a disturbance in the ecosystem but I don't know how that impacts anything. Probably not by too much since there's really not much out here, but that's kind of my guess of why that happens. Yeah, your leading hypothesis. Yeah. That makes sense. It kind of moves up the food chain that way. Another question is, how long do stringy siphonophores move and how long do they get? Oh man, um, they usually move from jet propulsion. So um, cephalopods and other jellies, they basically, they use their muscles and um, polychaetes kind of, not really, but um, they use their muscles in a certain way to like, act like kind of, I don't know how to describe it, like act like a rocket to move throughout the water column um, and I mean I would assume that they also use currents but you know mid water column there might not be huge currents so they have to expend a lot of energy to move in terms of how big they can get um, that all depends on the species of course there's I mean you can probably get anywhere from like one millimeter siphonophores to like 20 meter siphonophores. I know there was like a really, really big one off the coast of Australia. I think I brought that up before. Um, but it all depends. Usually depends on like food availability, um, currents, um, how productive the waters are. Yeah, a lot of factors. Yeah. It's interesting to see how life evolves in different ways and finds different ways of getting around. Some just go with the currents, others have their own little propulsion methods, whether that's like jellies to kind of pump and kind of push the water out of them, yeah. or fish with their fins going back and forth. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And the deep sea is also really cool too because you kind of can't predict, like you can kind of predict what things are gonna look like, but sometimes you see new things and you're like, what is that? And why does it look that way? Um, we don't know what a lot of, why a lot of the things in the deep sea look the way they look. Um, a lot of their adaptations are still like, we don't know why they're specifically that way. And that's also part of our, um, part of why we do these expeditions. Um, I guess you yeah. could also infer mm -hmm. from them, like, I guess general principles of, uh, we knew that Mars was in the past, indeed an ocean world and Mars had oceans and lakes on the surface. So to me, that was a connection with this ocean. And now we know Mars has one because we found a mineral uh, 20 years ago. What was well, the mineral? Yeah, what was the mineral again? It's called gerosite. Uh, gerosite is a sulfate that only forms... <laughs> We're uh, all Google searching it. <laughs> it only forms when you have water. So you find gerosite, you know you had water there before. With a J. Oh, with yes. a J. Okay. I J A R O S I T. Pablo, what input are you on? Can you repeat that? Uh, he's, he's either on table one or table two. Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh, you're right. This is a beautiful mineral. It is, it is. Yeah. Okay, good choice, good choice. Yeah. All right, Kevin, bounce into you. Uh, my favorite mineral is wolfenite. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because I just learned about it when we were doing <laughs> these experiments in Anapom's lab in the University of Hawaii. Uh, and it was one of the ones that the predictor uh, algorithm on the software that Impossible Sensing um, made, made a r amazing match. Uh, we ch shot it, it was the first test, and it was like, this is wolfenite. Whoa. And it was wolfenite. That's so cool. And will you tell us what is, uh, what are you doing on board the Nautilus? Re-unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> I am running the Raman instrument. I'm from the University of Washington Applied Physics Lab. Uh, and I'm basically running two computers, doing images, and doing all the SSH pipe into the instrument and telling it to fire and all the different parameters, uh, doing all the tags, watching all the temperatures and all the engineering data to make sure that we're healthy. Um, and. Uh, Taking yeah. direction. Like, like Kevin like to say, uh, he's my personal uh, human <laughs> graphics interface. <laughs> uh, and I so wish y'all guys at home could see uh, all the computers and all the screens. It is the most, I want to say nerdiest thing. Like there are five computer screens, massive uh, computer interfaces right now. It's awesome. It's and of course, notebooks, paper, pencil, notebook. Because that never runs out of battery. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so we, we have so many computers because we are, um, uh, as you guys know, if you have been listening for a while, uh, we're testing new technology. And right now, uh, before we make the instrument smart, uh, uh, we have to make ourselves smart first. Uh, so Kevin and I are, are doing human intelligence here aboard this ship this time. Uh, maybe next time we have a little bit of AI uh, on board and fewer computers. So I have a question for you all guys. For the past couple of... Um days y'all guys have been testing on rocks and i know you were saying that one of the applications is potentially going to be living uh, substances such as coral is that going to be one of the items that you test tonight absolutely yeah i after we tested everything and we commissioned the instrument for full operations today we hope to really be able to shoot our first uh, coral uh, so and no pressure brian to find <laughs> us uh, a good spot to to shoot I, I am slightly optimistic that that after t yesterday's dive, we might see a lot of life again here. Um, and, it'll, and it'll be really interesting if we don't. Yay. Yeah. Okay, so I want to throw it over not to the ROVs, who are making sure that we are safely descending right to the bottom. But I want to throw it over to our video engineer, Daryl. Daryl, can you tell us about what you're doing and what your favorite mineral is? Uh, we're gonna, uh, what I'm currently doing right now is troubleshooting on why the video inputs got switched on the record deck, and I think it's because some uh, we had a salvo must have switched. 
Um, my favorite mineral, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, you know what? I actually don't know. <laughs> Can't think of anything right now. What? Gotcha. Not a diamond? Yeah, I was going to say sapphire, Shine ruby. Like ruby. Oh, right sapphire is nice. Like, okay, sapphire. Love it. So, Corley, we have a joke that came in online, and I do not understand it. Yeah. <laughs> What's a geologist's favorite day? A uh, good nice day? Nice. Oh, so the G is silent? Yeah, the G is silent. It's nice. It's a type of uh, rock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for those at home, what's a geologist's favorite day? It's a nice, nice day. day. Spelled, Spelled G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we we love making those jokes, and it, like after every like undergrad geologist goes to field camp, they'll post an in, like an Instagram and be like, "Had a nice time." Oh my god, <laughs> that's kind of like the equivalent of all the band nerds being like, "You never want to show up flat. You never want to show up yeah. sharp. You always want to show up on time." Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh, so silly. What is it? Uh, never be flat. Never be sharp. No, uh, always be, uh, sometimes be sharp, sharp. Oh my God, what's the other one? I had a sweatshirt, like <laughs> I actually wore that sweatshirt. All right, so Corley, <laughs> you were kicked off of SPL for the <laughs> remainder of the three hours and 15 minutes. What no more. Oh. Always be natural, that's what it was. Oh, that's right. Never, that's right. never, never be, be sharp, never, never be, be flat. flat. Sometimes be sharp, always be natural. <laughs> And Chris, somebody online says that ice is their favorite mineral as well. Uh, good. <laughs> ice is a pretty cool, I mean, these are all cool minerals. Yeah, so many different ones. And I had to Google search almost every single one of them. So as y'all guys can see, we have made it down to the bottom. We're doing a couple of checks before we can get ready to start exploring. So Chris in Ohio, his favorite mineral is bismuth because it's melted and cooled and it can form metallic crystals with shiny, colorful crystal surface surfaces. Oh, somebody else likes salt too. I always love going to the Houston Museum of Natural Sciences and they have an entire uh, very secure, very heavily guarded section with minerals and gemstones and it is my absolute favorite section because there is of course your standard like sapphires and rubies and emeralds and then you have these other minerals that I've never even heard of and form these beautiful formations and I'm not a geologist but it definitely makes me want to learn a lot more about geology visiting that section. Mineralogy is super cool. It's kind of a hard field though because you have to know a lot of, of like material science background. Which is fun, but kind of difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but I also love, like, in natural history museums, mm -hmm. the, the mineral, mineral section. section. It's so fun to look at all the different pretty shiny yeah. things. <laughs> I know. That's exactly it. I'm like, ooh, shiny. shiny yeah. <laughs> ooh, that's a big sapphire. <laughs> I went to uh, the Smithsonian in DC for the first time like a year ago, a year oh, and a half ago. And they my have, favorite. yeah, like what's really famous there is the blue diamond. The Hope Diamond? Yeah. Oh. Which is uh, really cool, but I remember everyone was staring, at, like, uh, standing around this diamond, taking pictures of it. 
and I'm just such a, I, I just like to make like little jokes and don't really like think about what I'm saying <laughs> sometimes. And I said out loud, oh, looks like blue cubic zirconium. And everyone like turned around at me and gave me like the meanest look. And I was like, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually heard that, um, so like a lot of this stuff they have out, they have um, like private collections like deep within uh, the Smithsonian. And in one of the collections they actually do have uh, the Hope Diamond in cubic zirconium, but it's because the Hope Diamond has such a long, like it was cut in half and then it mm -hmm. was had all these different cuts of it over time. They actually have it modeled in all of its different shapes I've throughout seen, time. Yes, yes. Okay, so my nerdiness is I have watched an entire documentary on the Hope Diamond. Oh, that's awesome. It, it, <laughs> so much nerdiness, but yes, and even including back in, what was it, 2000, where they took the Hope Diamond out of its setting and then custom made a new setting for it. And they showed the, uh, the, the gymnologist, I guess, who was like so intense, re putting it into a new setting. And they had online viewers. Like, I just love it. It's, and it's got such an interesting history. And yeah, starting off so much larger, so much bigger. And then now it's just like a little fraction of what it once was. Yeah. Kind of similar to what is it, the, the Koki Noor that is in the crown jewels from England. Oh. And it's so controversial that they didn't even, they took it out of the crown before Prince Charles's court, or now King Charles's coronation. Mm. Because there's a couple of different countries that all want it back. Yeah. And uh, I love Britain's re official response. Like, there's like four of y'all. We're not gonna, we're not gonna split the crystal in half and be like, or the diamond in half and be like, here you go. So they're like, we're keeping it until y'all guys can work it out. <laughs> Which <laughs> cracks me up. So, so we have a, yeah, go ahead, for, Paul. For, for all the geologists or scientists uh, alike uh, out there, you will be surprised and shocked to see that we're seeing microcrystalline yeah. quartz here in the sand. So Whoa. nothing. In the sand like that we're... Yeah, what, what I say ironically uh, is that, of course, you know, this is sand and you can see it in the screen, uh, very fine uh, light color. Um, so sand is oh. made of uh, all right, silica, silica, which is yeah. silicon dioxide. Uh, and quartz is one of the minerals that uh, a lot of people like because it's very common too. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, our instrument is uh, seeing now verifying that we have microcrystalline uh, quartz in this sand, which is no surprise, but it again shows that you know we're ready for yeah. science rock and rolling. Yeah. Um, so uh, hold on one sec, yeah. Cheyenne. What were you saying? Uh, we are all set up and ready to go. We can start moving towards our next waypoint or we can do something uh, with the laser if we need to. We've been playing around. We're good to go. I believe, yep, I think we're going to head on straight to waypoint two, please. Oh, wow. Awesome. All right. Let's get... <coughs> and Pablo and Kevin, what are, what are your interests here? When we see what do you want to stop and play with? Uh, so we, we in the last couple of days we've seen all of the uh, manganese crusts. Uh, so we've finalized that already, and it all looks good to us. Uh, sand, we already know it. So anything that doesn't look like sand or crust, uh, we're interested in that. That might be hard, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't tall order here. Uh, if you guys see in the screen, uh, uh, yeah. But uh, you, you don't see it in your screen, but uh, one of the top left screens in Mission Control here. Uh, you can see the laser spot uh, uh, at the bottom of uh, Hercules from the Atalanta uh, ROV. So, so we're gonna keep oh, we're gonna keep yeah. shooting. Perhaps we're gonna keep shooting on a traverse as we're going down. Uh, and if we find something interesting that we wanna stop a little bit longer, uh, Brian will will call you out. Yeah, that sounds good. Just shout out. We'll kind of continue on a normal kind of progression exploring. And if you see something you want to spend some time on, just shout out, and we'll we'll set it up. I don't know if you were uh, watching the dive yesterday, but there were those really like soft rock kind of turbidite looking things. Maybe if we have a chance, break off a piece and analyze that or something. Is that of interest? So Corley, I, am I hearing this correctly? <laughs> you want to take a rock sample back <laughs> with us? Did I, did I catch that? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> yeah, that's me.
come down uh, five meters. So the whole time that we're, or that Hercules is driving along, heading to our first waypoint, y'all are constantly firing the laser. And for those at home, you can kind of see that through Atalanta's feed sometimes, where at the bottom of Hercules, you're gonna see what looks like a little green light firing. That's different than the measurement lasers right that you're seeing in Sat Feed One. Yeah. Oh, it there it is. There it is, yeah. Quite a bit of current headed to uh, pushing us to the north again. So, what are y'all seeing on y'all side, Kevin and Pablo? Like uh, the uh, ship course over ground seems oh. to be two eight zero. Yeah, no. Can you ask a question? Two six please? zero. Uh, sorry. When I say that, we two can see uh, mirrors or these pigments, whatnot. What we see is uh, something we call spectrum of light. Uh, and the spectrum of light is nothing different than a visual res representation of uh, how many photons uh, our camera is seeing at different colors. So when you look at what the sun looks like, right? The sun looks yellow or white, depending on where you are and uh, time of the day. And that means it's a combination of all the colors in the spectrum that the humans can see, from the violet to the almost infrared. So uh, our camera can see a bit farther into the left towards the ultraviolet, a little bit farther into the uh, into the mid infrared, and, uh, and essentially what we're doing is is just uh, counting how much light we have at its different color, and this is telling us the composition of the targets that we're shooting at. And so, have you found any? You were talking about uh, some of the interesting things that you were discovering on the previous dive, with it being a lot of minerals already in the sand. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately we haven't seen a lot of diversity uh, in the other dives uh, and part of that is because we focused on, on doing functional testing. Mm -hmm. This means that we were focused on whenever we find something that we like, that we get good signal of, we spend a lot of time on it, uh, tweaking the different parameters of our system. Uh, so, so far um, we have uh, seen uh, quartz, as I mentioned here. Uh, we have seen a little bit of igneous minerals, uh, oh. perhaps the first yeah, parts yeah. that somebody mentioned as a favorite mineral, uh, or perhaps some more in the olivine side. Uh, it, this is all volcanic minerals, so it's consistent with where we are. And, uh, and that's pretty much all we've seen when it comes to minerals uh, so far. So uh, we're hoping that if we hit some collars today, uh, collars are made of carbonate, uh, so we will be able to see the carbonate signals um, pretty distinctively, and also some pigments if there is some color. Hey, Ren. I just think. So for those at home, this is our fourth dive testing out the Raman spectrometer. This is a brand new piece of technology. Uh, and y'all guys heard Pablo explain and Kevin explain a little bit about what we're doing, what they're seeing, how this data is gonna be utilized. And if you look at sat feed two at home, uh, you are seeing Hercules from Atalanta's view. And when Hercules gets close enough, you can see that green laser popping out, uh, firing, and that is the Raman spectrometer. So Brian, looking at the bed forms, because we keep coming back to this subject every night, what are you seeing about the bed forms here? <laughs> I'm asking the biologist about sand. I know, <laughs> I know. But like you said earlier, you were the, the resident nerd of the shift. Yeah, so this looks like we've got probably current from two different directions, is the way I'm reading this. Yeah, it looks asymmetrical and then it's not parallel. Yep. It's kind of cross-hatched. So according to what you read that one time <laughs> told us about. <laughs> according think. to last night's discussion yeah. in Dr. Google. So we've got about 150 meters or so till we hit the steeper slopes. 
Uh, and so we're going to take this opportunity to do a little pilot training as well uh, as we move over this nice flat, um, relatively safe seafloor. Um, so we're going to be here in the sand for just a few minutes um, and then we'll get underway. And so elaborating on what Brian just said, uh, right now we have an ROV intern named Ren. Ren, Cheyenne, and Dan were not able to talk earlier uh, when we were giving out our introductions because they, as y'all probably heard, were busy making sure we didn't crash into the bottom with the ROVs. So uh, Ren is our ROV intern, and him and Dan just switched spots. So Ren is gaining experience testing uh, Hercules. For the past couple of nights, he has been driving Atalanta, so now a fun little shift going on. And that brings up a good point, which is that the Nautilus is not just uh, this elite vessel with nothing but scientists who are at the top of their field. They're, that's definitely true, but it's also a teaching vessel. So we have several interns on board. Uh, we do a lot of education and a lot of outreach. We want to make sure that not only are we gaining some top-notch data but we're also able to teach others, everyone from interns to pre-K classes. And in fact, today I got to sit in and help out on an interaction that was being conducted in Olelo Hawaii, Hawaiian, which is the native language of Hawaii. And it was so neat seeing all these little ones conversing in Olelo and being a part of that, even though I could not speak a single word of Olelo other than mahalo and aloha, aloha. I learned a lot. That's awesome. So was there like a translator? Yes, actually, I'd, the whole reason I was like, Megan, can I jump on this call was because I knew the translator. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Kainalu. So Kainalu is a native Hawaiian speaker from the big island of Hawaii and was on board last year as a mapping intern. Oh, okay. Getting his master's degree from the University of Arizona, but just happened to be home in Hawaii, um, in Hilo. And he jumped on and kind of led the expedition, led the translations, and then it was so fun because he got to talk all about his mapping experience and tell the students how they were, how we mapped last year and why mapping was important. That's awesome. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, super, super cool dude. Absolutely. And earlier this year, so I guess it was around September. What is, what? yeah, what is that? Dead something? Dead something. Yeah, I'm not sure we just passed. That's a C pin right there. So my favorite pilot training story is we were in the canyons in the North Atlantic off the coast of um, Massachusetts. And we finishing up an expedition. I think we were like Lydonia Canyon or something. And we were out in the sand. We'd gotten out of the canyon. It was we just finishing up three and a half weeks at sea. It was our last dive. We were headed to port as soon as we got the ROV on deck. And uh, we took the last 15 minutes, and what basically just happened here in the control room happened on in the um, control room I was in, where the pilot got up and like just patted the seat and when looked at the um, co-pilot and was like, "Hey, try and fly the RV." <laughs> so Dan jumps in the uh, in the front in the seat for the first time, gets like goes up, down, left, right. Just barely it starts, and a 15-foot Greenland shark swims directly in wow. front of the vehicle. And he proceeds to fly with it for the next 10 minutes or so oh my um, and That's did awesome. a beautiful job of it. If you want to see the picture of the Greenland shark, it's actually the Wikipedia um, picture for Greenland shark is Dan's sixth minute <laughs> of flying an ROV. <laughs> cool. Let's go, Dan. That's so cool. That's definitely on my bucket list of, of things I want to see are Greenland sharks, especially if it could be like kind of dark and you could see their eyes glowing. So Brian, we had a question come in online. Uh, and they want a kind of a follow-up. So yesterday, you took some samples, and did the white coral turn out to be Paragorgia? Yep, we believe it is. We believe it's a white morph Paragorgia, uh, which is the second one we've seen on this expedition. 
we're particularly interested to see how the genetics will, will barcode it at least, if not run a, lo a larger uh, sequence on it and see where it falls out. And then the other sample that I'm, I'm sure people are curious about is this snail came up still attached to the crinoid, um, but it was not attached in the way I expected it to. It appeared to be just drilling into the crinoid from the side. It wasn't actually like reaching into its mouth or anything like that, like I kind of thought it would be. And it was well attached, like it took some force to take it off. Um, and there was one little, very, very tiny uh, wound on the crinoid, but a huge amount of very thick, extremely viscous mucus. Uh, and whether that was coming from the snail or the crinoid, I'm assuming the crinoid, but I don't know that for sure. Um, but I was really surprised when they came up still very much attached. And Ren, I know you were busy concentrating, but you are receiving a lot of encouragement here online. Oh, that's a good view of Atalanta, or from Atalanta. Oh, so earlier I was saying, uh, so Kainalu got to, there was, you know how Noah has those different speaker talks or, and whatnot. So Kainalu got to lead one and all the other interns and like kind of a group of us that was on board with Kainalu all zoomed in and oh. were like cheering for him. It was so cool. And then at the end he did like a little question and answer session and we were all lobbing him these softball questions like, how did you become so awesome? Why are you cool? <laughs> <laughs> So for the past couple of nights, we have been sampling eDNA or environmental DNA. But we had a question here, um, and it's asking, what is barcode DNA? I've never heard of that term. So it, it's not a type of DNA. It's a, it's a process of looking at just certain regions of DNA that are known to be highly variable or highly conserved, depending on what you're looking at, and get an idea of, um, you know, basically pick say a hundred regions in, in your genetics and just sample those hundred regions um, to see if, if there's a difference. And so it's kind of a, a quick way uh, to establish where things fit in lineages without having to run like a whole genome sequence or even sequence an entire particular gene. Um, so it's, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's an efficient way to establish relationships um, or match area, you know, if we know what the barcode, quote unquote, looks like uh, from an existing reference sample and we just check those same regions on another organism, we can see if it just quickly maps to something we already know. Awesome, thank you. So Brian, I know you used to do some deep sea work over in the Gulf or right outside the Gulf and you found the, the asphalt flower. Um, did you ever get to do any work about the Bahama blue holes or those very deep? Nope. Nope, never, never did any Bahamas work. Although I want to really, really, really go scuba diving there. But the water's are warm. Don't need a wetsuit. Oh, I love it. It was like that in pa um, Panama and Honduras. Just, oh, it was perfect. Because if you wear a wetsuit, you have to wear weights or something, mm -hmm. right?
I always put on like a little jacket, like a little, because I have a, a two-piece Farmer John type wetsuit and I get super cold underwater. So I wear my little jacket and then I put on like a couple pounds of weight and that was all I would need. And the water was warm. It was so crystal clear. And the biodiversity was just astounding. Speed limit in these here waters is 300 millinots. <laughs> The uh, nautical traditions have lots of obscure size, distance um, trad measurements, and sometimes I enjoy breaking out random ones like the cable um, and driving other people nuts when I ask for the ship to move five cables or something like that and <laughs> see how long it takes them to figure out how to do it. I'm sure the... Uh the ship's crew loves that so much. Well, I started that when I was the ship's crew and I was doing it to other members of the ship's crew. <laughs> but not, a, and it's really, I don't know why, but nautical science has lots of different things that they use consistently, like a shot. You measure anchor can't chains in shots, which are about 90 feet. Or we have fathoms, which are about seven feet. Um, we have cables, which are a quarter, a tenth of a nautical mile. We have nautical miles. No one else uses nautical miles. I don't. It's an interesting history of how um, maritime industry still holds on to um, some of these obscure units of measure. So, Brian, going back to the snail that you found um, on the crinoid. Is it the culprit behind the crinoid beheadings, or is there still other possible culprits out there for definitely, the... Definitely unknown. I would be surprised if the um, snail was the culprit. The snail was so small, I can't imagine it would ever be able to cut off the entire crinoid head, one. And two, I don't really think that would be advantageous for the snail. Um, so I think it's something bigger than that snail. Whether it's a different type of snail or not, I don't know. A viewer online said that they used to work with Dan and they measured speed in turtles, tectonic turtles. Ren, when you're comfortable, if you can fly us over one of these, what are the black kind of dead looking things? We've seen three or four of them and I don't know what they are. Okay. Thanks. That's fine. Well, yeah, we're, I mean, we've seen several, but if we can just direct them over, the, direct it over one, that'd be great. Uh, there's just like, there's been two or three of these, almost looks like fallen pieces of plant material or something. I'm not sure what they are. We'll probably see more. We don't need to backtrack or anything, but if we just see something, if we can run over it directly.
Well, as we're slowly scanning to go find one of those black little patches of whatever it is, we have a question about eDNA. Um, so how expensive is equipment and how comprehensive are the results? So it depends on what level of equipment. So most of the most places now don't actually do their own sequencing. They send it out to um, a service, and so they will do like the extraction in house potentially, where you'll filter it and then remove the DNA. And and those are they're just kits. Like you can just buy a kit from a couple different companies. It's very cookbook uh, if you've got you know pipettes and basic laboratory equipment like a centrifuge, it's not um, really that hard to go through and do, extract the DNA and purify it into just DNA, and then you'll send that out to a sequencing company um, and ask them to do whatever level of sequencing, either target certain regions or do larger um, group sequencing, and they send you back some some level of data. Generally, they send you back pretty pretty raw data, and it's up to you to do the bioinformatics of assembling it and matching it. Um, um, and it's in, it's in the order of hundreds of dollars per sample, generally, to get it um, done. But, you know, ten, many tens to low hundreds per sample. Is that a cus uh, cuskiel? Uh, rat tail? Oh. Yeah. Its head isn't big, right? I, I believe it's a rat tail. Okay. Rat tail grenadier. So in previous dives, um, like that Nautilus has done, there seems to be a lot of echinoderms on the bottom of the seafloor. But over here, we're not really seeing any. Is there a reason for that? Do they like muddy surfaces better? Uh, are sands not really for them? Or is it just we're at a weird spot, possibly? Any of those are great hypotheses, and I don't have an answer for you. It is one of those things that's interesting <laughs> about the deep sea. The deep life in the deep sea broadly is very patchy. You often find very little of it um, or a lot of it. Uh, and sometimes when you find a lot of it, you find one group of organisms. And if you find a lot of it somewhere else, it's a different group of organisms. And uh, this is especially true actually in the sediments. If you run around here with push cores and box cores and start looking at what looks like very homogeneous sediment, you will probably find really dramatic differences in what's living in the sediment on the order of just meters. Um, it's one of the kind of mysteries of the deep sea is how complicated the community ecology is within deep sea sediments. Um, and so any number of those same influences on what causes the s life in the sand and sediment to change would also probably influence um, they're predators, like the detritivores, like sea cucumbers. So I really don't know why this particular spot, um, but it, it is an interesting observation that we see. And there's no bio, we, we generally call the trade, the feeding trades, uh, feeding traces and stuff like that. You see when uh, uh, sea cucumbers something moves, so we call it bioturbation. And so you can see their trails of where they've been, their fecal deposits, whatever, and I'm seeing nothing here mm -hmm. um, to indicate this is, is bioturbated at all. Um, so with the exception of these couple fish and one or two sea pens, we've seen very little to no macrophon out here. So I have a question for Cheyenne. So Cheyenne, you are the navigator for this lead. You are also at the Coast Guard Academy. What training did you have to, to get you ready to be the navigator for the ship? Um, no really specific training for the programs that we use, but I have taken a lot of navigation classes. Um, I also am on the sailing team, so that's helped out a lot. And some of, actually some classes that I didn't think about helped me, like my GIS class. 
says some of the programs are similar. Um, my boat class. So kind of just like random pieces that I find are helpful, but nothing super specific. Can you kind of walk us through like what you do? Because I know for a lot of people we say navigator and we say they uh, talk between the ship and the ROV pilots, but can you kind of flesh that out a little bit more? Yeah, I think there's a little lantern shark yeah, down it's a there though, shark. Oh, if you want to. It's more interesting than me. <laughs> Don't worry, Cheyenne, we'll come back to you. So is that a lantern shark, the glow-in-the-dark sharks? That is that is my first guess, but luckily Ken Sulak is in the chat and will probably be able to tell us exactly what it is. Thanks, Ken. So we're not sure if it's a lantern shark quite yet, but a couple of fun facts about a lantern shark. They do glow in the dark and they are about the size of your palm, size of your hand. And I hope this little friend comes swimming over so we can get a good look at him. Perfect timing video. Oh. Look at how it's moving. So interesting. Seven. Looks like it has very large eyes heterocercal tail, meaning the top part is bigger than the bottom part. Uh, something common with benthic sharks, sharks that swim along the bottom. That way they can get a lot of power but not disturb the sediments down below. And out of screen it goes. So Cheyenne, you get a momentary reprieve. <laughs> yes, so um, as a navigator, um, before the ROVs get in the water, there's a lot of programs that we have to start up and make sure are running properly. There is a little like sonar device that we enter into a hole in the ship and it tracks the ROVs, so you have to make sure that that program's up and running. We have a mapping program that we make sure everything is loaded to. And then once we start, we're kind of the communication between the different parts of the ship and make sure everybody is set up and everything proceeds safely. We have a pretty long checklist we have to go through for that. And then during, we tell the bridge how to move the ship to get to our different waypoints, mm -hmm. which it's kind of important because we're like in the control van, so we know what's going on here. And it'd be hard for the bridge to know what's going on there um, because they're in a different room. And we also help with mapping, which is not as exciting as ROV dive. <laughs> so what do you do on a mapping? Because uh, I know last night, once we pulled the ROVs out of the water, we started mapping again. So what, do you, what does your mapping shift entail? Yeah, so basically you just watch the sonar and make sure that everything runs smoothly. And you also have another program up that tells the ship where it's supposed to go. So you make sure that the bridge knows where they're going and you can, there are a few things you can do. I'm not very good at the mapping I just started, but 
depending on your experience level, if the sonar is not looking great, you can help change some of the settings to get better data. Um, the biggest one is kind of changing how wide the sonar goes out. The nearer the beams, the more data you collect. So if your data is kind of spotty, you can narrow it in a little bit to try to help that get more data mm -hmm. and better data. And then we also go and edit the sonar. So there'll be the pings. So sonar sends the sound waves down to the bottom and they bounce back up and then the ship receives that as a ping. So there's a whole bunch of dots that are separate pings. So when you go into um, an editing program, you see all the dots individually. So you can clean up some of the dots that are obviously noise or just, just noise is just anything that interferes with the sonar and gives it bad data. So if there's a dot that's like 100 feet above all the other dots, it's probably just noise. It's not actually like something floating out. It's not the ground floating out in the middle of the ocean, so you can edit that. Man. Thank you, Cheyenne. Sorry, back row, I don't know if uh, you guys noticed up here, but the kids are running the boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's Didn't always to good. Ignore you there. Yeah, no worries. I definitely remember a, a, a shift a long time ago now for me when I was in the front row where we had, I think, the the average age was 23 in the front <laughs> row. Good lord. Hey Dan, we have a comment about tectonic turtles measuring speed. Oh yeah. You want to explain that one? It's really um, a bummer because we have this brand new Nav G program that everyone's been talking about for, I don't know, years now. And then first thing I look over at it, and I'm like, well, where's the DBL speed? There's no DBL speed on the thing. It's like a downgrade. The measuring speed thing, I, I forget what that was all about. Uh, we obviously had calmer weather back then. Uh, we used to get the, so the speed, uh, Hercules speed over ground is derived from our Doppler velocity log. And, uh, We've long tried to get Hercules over two knots. I don't I think we were trying on there, that's where that came from. I'm not sure how so the last can't remember the details. They're getting fuzzy fuzzier every year. I completely understand that. What's that? All the details getting fuzzier and fuzzier every single year. Earlier today, I had to have a deep thought with myself about, did I even do this interaction earlier? Do we get an idea on the shark? Uh, <coughs> a dogfish, most likely, is what the current conversation is thinking. I'm kind of disappointed. I really wanted it to be a lantern shark. I mean, granted, they are they're in the same family, yeah, squalid they're in the same family. <laughs> I'm going to come up just a few meters there. Football's going to come up and bonk us. Bonk me.
Dan, can we fly directly over what's up basically straight ahead of us? Sure. Are you li yeah, Ren's listening now. Okay. I'm kind of multitasking up there. There's a lot already an old season pro. <laughs> <laughs> Moment of truth. What is this thing? Is that a sponge? Is that? I am. Yeah. Not sure yet. Good morning for, to the Maldives. Thanks for joining us. So we do think it's uh, probably a sponge, uh, Seriocolophus uh, is the current guess. I can just ask him to push in a little more when you're comfortable. No cursing. What would your grandma say? <laughs> and, and then when you guys have a second, we'd like to trip a Niskin here as well. Right. So as we're thinking, we're mainly the the Niskins are our water collection bottles, and we're using them primarily on this expedition for um, eDNA. And so if you've been watching a lot, you've seen us tripping them okay, uh, or firing the bottles the when we've been close to high density no communities uh, or high, high abundance uh, communities. But we want to take one right now um, as a way to test our method. We're out so here, no visible corals anywhere close. We don't have what looks like any rocks on sonar. Um, and so there's likely no corals out here. Um, so we want to so get a water sample and use that basically as a, a um, little bit of a comparison or a control to see what the concentrations or uh, what corals camera. we can detect out here where we don't see any and compare that to areas where we have uh, a lot of corals. So I'm uh, retracting the pan and tilt now. That's going to change your view a little bit. You can... Uh, Keep an eye on your sonar, and you got the down-looking camera there. You should be good. Then I'm going to pan left, and you're completely going to lose your... I'm going to turn on the uh, disruptor here. Do you want to target on high pack for those samples? Yes, please. I'm going to go for low-hanging fruit here. What would you like to name a sample? That should be Niskin number six trip to there. That's sample 042. I didn't catch that. 042? Yes. Roger, 042. Mm. we do here is because we don't know exactly where the camera is. So we'll just uh, I don't know, retract a little so now could it go so far? I usually center it back up a little. And then I extend it all the way back out again. Oh, there's something to look at. So here looks like another sponge. I am not used to seeing sponges out here in the sand like this. Oh, it's not very, it's not, 
I don't think it's very common, but I also try and avoid the sand as much as possible, generally. Yeah, how come we're in the sand? What's up with that? We do have okay, a question. Uh, navigator, uh, there. for practice, uh, could you try and be over that sponge and we'll try and shoot it with a laser? Yeah, we can try and laser it. See that laser there in that camera? Fly up till that laser is the sponge. Mm -hmm. You could get a quick zoom on the way. You're not going to have a lot of time here, so. Well, keep coming ahead. And that camera on the laser is backwards, so. So the laser will turn on periodically, uh, but I'll, it'll turn back on shortly afterwards. Okay. Let go of the stick now, Ren. I've got you an auto XY, so. <laughs> Alexa, put the laser over the sponge. We do have a viewer um, uh, asking, how big of a target do they need for a laser? Or how so big we're, is we're trying to test the Raman spectrometer okay. on uh, uh, this sponge. So we're hovering you're above it. You can't see it um, and to any the of your feeds like on shore because so the laser is downward so shooting get it back um, off now. the aft end of the vehicle. So the pilots are having to navigate by the other situational awareness cameras um, as they try and move the... 5,000 pound vehicle over the four inch um, <coughs> sponge. Yeah, and then there's two lasers on Herc. So there's the laser for the Roman spectrometer in the back, and then there's the two lasers that you see in Herc view on SAT 1 feed. And those lasers uh, are spaced 10 centimeters apart uh, to give us a, dist uh, a distance or an estimate uh, of how big things are down now? here. I'm straight forward. And, and for, for scale, um, the yeah, field of view easy, or easy. the footprint of the Raman laser okay. on the ground the stick. is about uh, 10 to 15 so millimeters. Don't touch it again. Uh, I'm flying less than one inch. From here. This is called uh, Auto XY, so the DVL is now flying the vehicle. But we're going to run out of time here. And, uh, Okay, turn your laser on. Turn it on, turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> is the laser adjustable or is it set? It, it is only adjustable in the direction of the laser, meaning that we can adjust how far off we're measuring from the instrument, but we cannot um, point it in the XY. So we are we are relying exclusively on the pilot skills to, to keep us target. Okay. Thank you. And the camera is backwards, so we have to uh, input the opposite command. So I have to sit like this while I'm pressing the mouse. <laughs> oh, that's fun. <laughs> I'll, I'll fix that for next time. <laughs> I don't Did know if we ever got on it there, Pablo. Oh, that, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, let's see. That's not us. Look, we're not touching it. All we're doing is clicking the mouse button here. Oh. Uh, we're going to have to go. 
Okay. Yep. Uh, okay. We'll, 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 we'll see if the signals are, are diagnostic of the sponge. Uh, right. We may be too close to the target. Might, might get one more zap on it there. But okay, I'm going to disengage auto XY and you have control of the vehicle again. Thanks for the detour, guys. So you're going to have to, yeah, full stick, change your head to the south southwest again and then full stick. There's a wicked, pretty wicked current pushing you. Yeah, it moves 10 meters in a heartbeat. Yeah, it's a Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> you have Hercules, uh, you have the tether, you have Atalanta, uh, you have the flock or the submarine snow moving across the uh, across your camera. Uh, the fish are a good telltale. They usually have their you usually have their, uh, you know, they keep their nose into the end of the current. Um, but you, usually I'll just, you know, let go of the stick for a minute and see which way it takes it takes me. Ooh, do I see rocks coming? <laughs> yeah, there's a little hint of some rocks out there. Do you ever think you'd be so excited to see rocks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to uh, come up a bit on you. You are. So do you want to eat dinner? a bit now. Um, if you want to go eat dinner, I can uh, jump in there and you can we'll find Sarah to let her come up here. I'm trying to say of like evolution and like evolution I'm assuming and also like I say physics too like, oh yeah like water mm -hmm. physics and what's like the most energy efficient way for an animal to move and yeah how does that factor into its structure yeah things like that yeah um kind of like an example of that is um if you've watched our past two dives you we've highlighted the stalked crinoids um, the stalked feather stars, the sea lilies, um, they usually face a certain direction because there's no light down there, of course, but they need to get nutrients somehow. And there's usually some sort of current down there. We were actually experiencing quite a big current, I believe, when we were down there, and it kind of made things difficult to navigate in some ways. Um, but usually they'll be facing towards that current so they can pick up whatever food is getting swept up in the water column towards them. See, life always finds a way to evolve with its environment and with the stresses of its environment as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. So a little change. more... Uh, So on a little more lighter topic, uh, I'll just go around the question of the day. So what's everybody's last book that they've read? Or are they reading anything on this expedition? Books. Books. <laughs> um, 
great question. Daniel, do you know your book off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, I just finished one. It's, uh, it's called Sun, but it's a part of the Giver series, and it's the last book in the series. And it's actually really good. I started about four or six months ago, and I finished all four books. And oh. I'm pretty proud of myself because I really don't like to read, but That's awesome. I feel like that was a good challenge. Yeah. Especially being on long expeditions like this. Yeah. I my weakness is that I'm a I'm a TV person, so um, on this ship we only have a certain amount of bandwidth per person, so we can't stream video. Um, and HBO Max just went to Max, so all of my downloads are deleted. Wait, that that actually happened? It did. Man, it I have did. some downloads on there. I know, I know, um, but my I think my last book. Oh gosh, I'm. It's really hard for me to pay attention while reading, but I think, I mean, I guess the last book, I, I didn't finish it, but the I've been reading the Quran, actually. Um, oh, nice. Wow. Just some light reading. Yeah, just some light reading <laughs> right there. Um, but yeah, really not much of a reader outside of that. I just started a book about halfway through a book called We the Navigators. Oh, it's yeah. really good. Chris, I yeah. don't know. Maybe it's just my headset, but I don't know if I can hear you. Oh. Is that better? Yeah, I think so. So we're about to go Test through a station. shift change here, and uh, I'm going to transfer my station over to Katie, and yeah. she'll be on your four to eight watch, and you'll have lots of fun with her. <laughs> we're still just descending mm -hmm. at about um, almost 1,100 meters. We have about 200 to uh, 300 to go. So that's going to be roughly 10 minutes-ish, 8 minutes. 10 minutes. All right, and yeah, shift change. So I'm leaving. Have a great rest of your day, afternoon, or night. Chocolate frosting. Oh. So it's close. Yes. I'm getting closer. Fantastic. That's why they were making you chocolate something yesterday. Yeah. do a video sound check and it looks like I need to up my audio cool
Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Porta 8 shift on SPL. I am Katie Doyle. I am the Science Communication Fellow on Watch This Lead. A uh, huge shout out to Daniel, who just went on break for right now. He did an awesome job leading us into this watch. So as y'all guys are following along at home, feel free to type in any questions, any comments into the search bar at nautiluslive.org. You can ask us any kind of questions or if you have any comments, we'd love to hear them. So this is our, oh gosh, is this our fourth dive? Fourth successful dive? I believe it is. So last night we had an amazing dive filled with so many unique creatures that just constantly kept us on our feet, starting off with a very unique octopus um, and then ending with this amazing solitary hydro hydrozoid what was Hydro that hydrozoin hydrozoin thank you what, but it's called a hydroid hydrozoid no hydro solitary hydroid that's hydroid it. there we go so we are currently descending the vehicles down uh we're going to be diving on an unnamed guillot number one two three and we're about yeah 110 120 uh, miles northwest of kingman reef this is, oh my gosh, this is, I believe, day number 10 of this expedition. Or at least for me, for me, since right. leaving Texas. <laughs> I know I have a checklist, and every morning I wake up and I check it off, and I'm like, and it has, like, days since I left Texas. How many days I have, or we have been aboard. Sometimes oh, those nice. numbers kind of just mix up in my brain. I know, I have no idea how long we've been out here. I've just... <laughs> I, believe, I believe this is day eight underway. Great. Yes, because wow. we left last Tuesday, and it is Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and this is actually the same seamount we were diving on yesterday, but we were on the west side of it, and this dive is on at a similar depth and a similar structure feature on the east side. So are we going to be doing the same pattern, kind of like we did yesterday, where we start at the bottom and ascend our way to the top, ending up with the tabletop at the guillot? Or are we going to be doing the opposite, starting at the top and working our way down? No, we're going to be coming up from the side. So we're going to land um, kind of off this, this. It's a little nubbin. It's a little mound thing that we're kind of don't quite understand what geologically would have formed it. geological turn? Nubbin. nubbin? I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look, <laughs> look at our geologist for that. I mean, I would definitely call it a nubbin. Yeah. I love that word. Um, and I think maybe one of the ROV pilots or Brian could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the reason why we go bottom to top is because it's actually harder to drive the ROVs down than it is to drive them up. Corley, what input are you on? I'm on science, uh, science, science, science left. left. Thank you. Go ahead, speak speaking. Can you, can test, you? test. One, two. Go ahead. Good? Yep. Yep. Okay. So as we're descending down and the same thing that we do every day, if we can go around, say our name, say what we're doing on board the Nautilus. And yesterday I made the horrible decision of asking y'all for your favorite cookies, mm -hmm. which made me so incredibly hungry for, for the next hour and a half until dinner. 
So this time I want to ask, what is front your row, favorite? Front row, front row is going to check out. We're 50 meters off bottom, so we need to uh, oh, not bash the ROVs into the rocky <laughs> seabed at blazing speed of one meter or not. So we'll just tune up for a while. Uh, we'll get back with you when we get all sorted out up here. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. So favorite mineral. So for me, my name is Katie Doyle. I'm a science communication fellow. I am from Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, right there on the Gulf of Mexico. And my favorite mineral is going to be, I want to go with salt. Halite. OK, salt is mine. That's uh, the mineral halite. And so like the halocline is like, the measure of salinity in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So anytime you hear the word like halide in oceanography, it means salt. Uh, I don't know why geologists <laughs> name the mineral halide. Why they didn't just keep it salt, but darn geologists. Yeah, that's what they like to do. Adam, if you're listening below, we are tossing total shade at the geology profession right now. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, my name is Coralie Rodriguez. I am a graduate student at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Um, I study rocks. My favorite mineral is either olivine or pyrite. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where the sun is in relation to your position on the planet. Uh, <laughs> I'm Brian Kennedy, the watch lead and dork. Um, I'm, a deep sea <laughs> I'm a deep sea benthic ecologist, um, and I'm going to go with feldspar for no particular reason. Which type of feldspar? Oh, I'm a biologist. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I even have to like Google search what is feldspar. It's a volcanic mineral. Oh, feldspars are the most common minerals on the Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, Chris, what about you? Uh, hello, my name is Chris. I am a data logger on board the Nautilus. And uh, I don't know, my favorite mineral, I really like water. I don't know if it counts <laughs> as a mineral. But uh, if not, I'd have to go with oxygen. I'm kind of partial to it. So. Like ice? What? I, I guess yeah. ice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> ice. Ice, OK. All right, all right, I love it. Can we toss it over to our Rama spectrometer team? Yeah, I can <laughs> never find the unmute button. It looks like Zoom hell here. There's so many <laughs> buttons over there. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Pablo Sobron. I'm a scientist at the SETI Institute and also the founder of a startup uh, called Impossible Sensing. Uh, my favorite mineral is uh, Jerosite. Uh, and it is because we found that on Mars about 20 years ago. And this is how.